to mention I'm in uh, Academic Technologies. My title is the Coordinator of Instructional and Assessment Platforms, and so what that means, to kind of boil it down in a way that won't make your eyes glaze over, is one of the things that I do is help make Blackboard um, good <laughs> so that people like it and find it useful. Um, and so here are a few people that, that are involved in Blackboard. Uh, they're, one might say, Blackboard experts, but uh, as a testimony of how suggesting a good idea can volunteer you to do something, um, this really was sparked by a conversation, a few conversations actually, that Shauna Anderson and I had, uh, where Shauna was saying, you know, there's a lot of really nice features in Blackboard that I'm not sure if people are really fully aware of. And I said, you should talk about that in a workshop. And so that got us uh, to start thinking about what kind of things do we want to talk about that might be new um, or time savers or features that could promote student success that are in Blackboard. And how can we kind of spread the word about that? And so this, this is the genesis of why we decided to put this presentation together. Um, so like Jeff mentioned, we've got Shauna Anderson from the College of Business and Economics, who's also the assessment uh, coordinator for foundational studies. So she's got a unique perspective on, on using Blackboard in effective ways. Um, and really, I don't want to frame this. Wait for the feedback to that. I, I don't want to frame this necessarily as like an all about Blackboard kind of event, because really it's just a tool. And we're, we want to talk about how that tool can be useful as a time saver and as a, as a tool that might promote student success. Um, so after Shauna talks about some of the examples of things that she uses, um, Susan Shadle, the director for the Center for Teaching and Learning, is going to talk about um, strategies that you might use, Blackboard tools, but really more just general strategies about promoting student success in your course. And then Drew is going to walk through some of the actual tools and, and the details of how you might set up and use some of these functions. So with that, I'm going to turn, turn it over to Shauna, and she will talk about some of her favorite things in Blackboard. Hey, Lee's right. It did start with me saying, wow, I really like this Blackboard upgrade. There's things that are super cool that I'm using that save me time, and um, I think more people should know about it. So I just wanted to talk about two or three of my favorite things in the new Blackboard, which I never thought I'd say favorite thing in Blackboard in the same sentence, but here it is. Um, so my absolute favorite thing in the new version of Blackboard is the inline grading in the gradebook. So to grade papers, you don't even have to leave the gradebook which for me is a really big deal. I teach writing courses and I spend a lot of time grading. So saving me three or four or five minutes of paper is a really big deal. Um, and I have a screen capture here of what it looks like within Gradebook um, because I didn't want to show any student information. But you can see um, the student's paper is in half of the screen and then in the other half of the screen I can assess, uh, access the rubric and grade the paper. So I don't have to download it, I don't have to print it, I don't have to do anything, it's right there. I can also add comments within the PDF or Word document if I'd like, um, but it's really fast to use and then as soon as I finish the rubric, it's added to the Grade Center. Um, and I never, I never have to leave that window, which I love. You can see that this paper is 12 pages long, so multiply that by as many students as I have, you know, 28 students per course and the number of courses I teach. Saving three or four minutes of paper is a big deal to me. So that's one example of inline grading. Um, the discussion boards, you can also grade in line, which is also new. Um, I always hated having to go to the discussion board, which is a few clicks, and then back to the gradebook. But now you don't have to. It's within the gradebook as well. You can just click, um, you know, access the grades. And the window pops up here with the student's discussion board entry. I can edit the grade right there. And it also has a window that shows me all of my students who have posted to the discussion board. And I can click on the students there and go from one to another without leaving the gradebook. So there's a lot of things that make the gradebook so much more easy to navigate in this version of Blackboard than in the older versions of Blackboard. And again, a huge time saver for me personally. And then this is a, you know, maybe a smaller feature for some people, but I always liked using the course calendar in Blackboard um, because those, the calendar posts to the dashboard for students. But in the old version of Blackboard, um, the assignment would generate the entry within the gradebook but it wasn't linked to the course calendar, so to use the calendar, you had to enter information in more than one place. And for me, if I have to enter information in more than one place, I'm gonna make an error. It's just a matter of time. Um, so I'd have one date in the course calendar and another date in the gradebook or in the, the assignment. But this gets rid of all that. Everything is linked, so as soon as you add a date to an assignment, 
um, in the, using the assessment tool, it pops up in the gradebook and in the course calendar. And anytime you change it, it rolls to all of those places. So it makes it easier for students to keep track of it, and it makes it, um, you know, reduces my chance of making an error. So those are my three top favorite features in the new version of Blackboard. Um, and then I've also used the assessment tool, which helps me keep track of students, and Su Susan's going to talk about that next. So thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm actually not going to talk about the tool, but I'm going to talk about some strategies that might be useful for thinking about why you would want to use them, and then Drew's going to talk about the tool. Um, so what, as I started thinking about this topic of engaging students for success with Blackboard, what are the tools that we might use? Um, I went to a paper by George Koo that was in the Chronicle of Higher Ed um, that says something kind of obvious, which is whether students persevere and how much they get out of their studies is largely the result of their individual effort and involvement, right? This is something that we all know. Um, but the question that raises for me is, are there things we as faculty can do um, to better create an environment so that students put out a large individual effort and get involved? Um, and there's a couple of things that were also in that paper. So these the principles that I'm going to share came out of that same, same reference. Um, and three of them here, I think, are relevant. Um, one is, teach students as early as possible to use college resources effectively. So we put information in our syllabi, we tell students things in class, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they always understand what it is we mean. Um, and so thinking about what are the, how do we create opportunities to help students understand what we want them to do, but also to remind them um, so that they, they start to understand what our expectations are. Um, make the classroom the locus of community. How do we create a sense for students that we are paying attention to what they're doing and we have high expectations for their performance. Um, and then supporting students when they need help. One of the difficulties is we don't always know when they need help, and so are there tools we could identify that would help us to figure out when that is? Um, and I think Blackboard can help with some of these things. Um, so one idea in that vein of helping students to understand what the expectations are and, and use the tools that are available to them early in the semester is to create early in the semester, low stakes engagement kinds of activities about things that really matter. So for example, right away, having a discussion board post. That discussion board post might be about something like, what do you want to get out of the class? Or what previous class have you, has you, have you taken that you learned something about that you think will be relevant? But right away, before you've even introduced any new material, how do you get students engaged? And have it be something about something that matters for the course, even if it's not ultimately something you're going to test on or something like that. Um, another idea that's a very early in the semester, low stakes kind of thing, would be to create a survey in Blackboard or a quiz in Blackboard that might be about the syllabus. So ask students like, what's the highest grade you can get in this class if you don't do the homework? Um, have them actually do the calculation. Um, or what is the class policy on fill in the blank? Right? Force them to go and look at the syllabus in a way that perhaps they haven't. Um, without that prompt. Um, again, we, we put things in and we assume that students have learned both that they've read it, that they've digested it, and they've understood it, and often we need to create just a little bit more of, a, of an incentive for students um, to dig in. Um, along those same lines is early in the semester collecting some information from students. You could do this on a, Google, on a survey, you could do it on a Google form, whatever, but somehow collecting some information from students about the best way to contact them. Um, and, and I'll come back to why this is important, but what I have learned is that the, inf the contact information that PeopleSoft has is often incorrect because it's what students put in the system when they applied to Boise State, which may have been several years ago, or it might be their parents' phone number, or whatever. And if you want to try to get in touch with a student, you may be out of luck if they're not responding to their email. Um, and that's another way of also sending the students a message that, hey, I'm going to be paying attention to you. I may want to communicate with you over the course of the semester. You're part of a learning community in my course. And in order to do that, I've given you information about how to contact me on the syllabus. Now I need to make sure I know how to contact you. Um, so one of the other things that, that I think is important is to create a pattern of engagement through Blackboard. Now, it, this isn't important because it has to be done, but it's, it's going to create some opportunities to uh, implement those strategies. Um, a pattern of engagement that you can easily monitor for disengagement. So being able to see that there's a student who isn't doing what you think they ought to be doing. 
Now, you could collect a lot of paper stuff from students and sort it and figure out who hasn't handed stuff in. But one of the things that I think Blackboard offers for us is a way to create some things that can be easily monitored. Um, so that might be a regular reading quiz. Maybe it's just one question. Maybe it's a, um, a post to a discussion thread. Maybe it's a weekly question, something about something that's a big picture issue in the course and you ask them to answer that question or a related question each week. Um, or you ask them to post a question. You know, one of the things we know is that students don't ask enough questions, and so at requiring them every week, Monday morning, I want to see a question from each of you. And then right away, you've got a way to monitor who's not engaged in the regular activity of the course. Um, and again, um, that gives you a way to, to connect. One of the things we know is that we have a limited amount of time to focus on students. And what we, what we want to be sure of is that if we have some time to reach out and help students, that we're reaching out to the ones who really need it, and that we're using our time effectively. And so one of the things that I think Blackboard can help with is to focus our limited outreach time on the students that need it most. If we have collected information from them right away about how to reach them, then we don't have to go and search for, how do I get a hold of Joey? Um, you can look in your spreadsheet, you've got that information, you can, you, if they haven't responded to an email as the first um, point of contact, then you've got something there that you can pick up the phone or send them a text or whatever it is. Um, and if you've been monitoring their pattern of engagement, you know which students may need some, may, may need some outreach. Um, there's a tool called the Blackboard Retention Center that Drew's going to talk about how that works in a minute, but I think that's one of those tools that can kind of automate where should we spend our, our outreach time. Um, and then actually taking the time to outreach to those who are not engaging. And that doesn't mean hounding them for weeks and weeks on end, but er particularly early in the semester, there's some research that shows that if a student disengages in the first three weeks, if they're not coming to class regularly, if they're not doing every assignment, they're at a very high risk of just bagging it at some point. You know, they hit a glitch in week six and they're gone, right? And so if we can, particularly in those first few weeks, pay attention, and often the first three weeks are times when in our courses we don't have a lot of assignments coming in, so we can create some things that allow us to monitor just for the first three weeks, and then after that we might say, you know what, I don't have enough time. That might be true. Or by that time you kind of know who the personalities are, what, what, what kind of outreach might be effective. Um, so making students matter, again, this, this idea of having students feel like they're part of a learning community in our course. Um, so connecting every student in a meaningful way with an activity is also a way to help them feel like, okay, I'm paying attention to you for, as a student from the very first time you're, you're enrolled in the course. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Drew. Okay, thank you, Susan and Shauna, for uh, some good insight into that. So I'm going to go into the technical details of using the retention center, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on inline grading because I think Shauna did a great job of exposing how that's used. And basically how it is, is one thing to remember though in regards to the inline grading, is in order to use that tool, basically it supports Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and PDF files. Anything else that the student might submit, um, then you're kind of back to square one, you've got to download it and open it up in whatever application, and then do your reviewing that way. Uh, but you can still use the grading function within that inline tool. Okay, so on to the retention center. Um, as Susan said, you know, oh, I went the wrong way. Um, the retention center is automatically on. So by default, when you start your course site every semester, there's four rules that are out there that are set up by default. They may or may not be the rules that you choose to use. So you can certainly hide those, customize them, and we'll get into the but as I have shown up here on this slide, there's two ways to do that. One is to the global menu on the top right-hand side of your Blackboard course site, or through the control panel or course management menu, evaluation, and then retention center. Uh, the main table, as I mentioned, it has four rules. You have missed deadlines, grades, course activity, and then course access. And then depending upon your course site, and I'll show an example of this, you'll see this type of a bar uh, when you go into the retention center. And there's a lot of things that you can do in here to keep your students informed. Um, so we're talking about the customization. So as I said, you can use the four default rules. If you're fine with that, great. 
Um, you can also edit them to customize them to fit whatever needs you might want. And then you can also, there's no limit. You can create as many rules as you want out there to monitor whatever behavior you're after at your course site. And now we'll get to the tech side here. And I'm sorry, I forgot to log in. Escape. For those of you that are attending online, if you have any questions, or even those that are in the, the room here, um, feel free to ask away while I get logged in here. Is that showing? Okay, so as I mentioned, um, there's two ways to navigate to the retention center. One is via the drop-down arrow up here at the top right-hand side. And then you'll select this up down arrow here on the bottom left. So it's actually telling me by default, based on my rules, I have one new um, rule out there that's taken effect. The other way is to actually navigate into the course, go to your evaluation, and then retention center. And it's going to take a second or two here to load. Um, that's the other thing too, this retention center, depending upon your course size, it will spin out there for quite some time to get loaded. Okay, so here you can see, for example, this is one of my test sites out here. So no surprise, all of my test BSU students have been attending very well. Um, so it's telling me right from the get-go that nine students are currently at risk. Ooh, well that's not good, seeing as how I only have nine students. If I click on this red bar, now it's giving me the detail of those nine students. So here it's telling me nine students missed deadlines. There's four students that have low grades. Eight students didn't contribute. And a really bad one, eight students didn't even log in. And again, this is all based on the default rules that are out there. If I choose to notify these four students that have low grades, I can click on the number four. You'll notice down below here I have notify. I can click on the students. It's given me an error message because I didn't associate any email addresses to these fake students I have out here. But if there was real email addresses, it would come up and give me an email window and I could type in whatever canned response I want. And it goes to those four students blind carbon copy by default. So nobody else knows that there's someone else in the class in the same predicament as you are. Okay, so now to customize these, say I want to change some of these particular rules out here. In the top right hand side, you click on customize. Here's the default rules. Again, you've got a grade center rule, course access, activity, and then a deadline. If you don't want to see some of these, all you have to do is check the boxes and say exclude from risk table. You've basically turned off that rule. And of course, obviously, you can enable them at any time as well. You can also modify these existing rules, like I've done for this particular one on a deadline. Via the drop down menu next to that rule, select edit. And you can change this to whatever you would want it to be. Um, for example, I was helping an instructor earlier today that wanted to know kind of the opposite, didn't want to know who was actually failing in a course but actually wanted to notify those students that were getting B or, or, I'm sorry, A's in the class. So same kind of a thing, set up a rule. In this case, instead of saying below some type of a threshold, set it as above some type of a threshold, and the system will do it for you, and then you can just notify all of them at once. Very customizable. Um, 
For those of you, yes, Ken Zen, go ahead. Uh, I have a question on the activity rule. So what does course activity mean in Blackboard? How does Blackboard define that student is not contributing? Okay, so Ken Zen's question was, under the activity rule, how does Blackboard handle that particular course activity in this particular case? So as I have it set here, um, the default is activity in the last week is 20% below the course average. So that's it's looking at everybody else in the course and then it's comparing those students to everybody else. And then if you're below that particular percentage, then it'll flag you in the retention center. Um, um, so Ken's asked question is, so what type of activity is considered, so what does a student have to do to con be considered activity in the course? Um, so it's more than just logging in. <laughs> they would need to not only access the course, but participate in the discussion board, complete an assignment. They have to do something active besides just clicking around in the course. That particular one would be handled by um, the access rule, um, oh, which is the did not log in. And what else was I going to talk about? Um, oh, the other thing you can do too within the retention center, say that, you know, for example, here's my four um, students that have low grades, which is this column here for grades alert. So I could, if I wanted to see detail on any particular student corresponding to the particular alert that I'm interested in, all you do is just click on the, the orange dot and it'll tell you what the reason why they're seeing a grades alert. So in this case I have my threshold set to tell me who has a grade less than 70% for this particular assignment called um, Hoodoo Assignment. And in this particular case, this student had a 60 out of the possible 100, so then it's flagging me. Is this a student that's consistently bad about turning in lower performing assignments? Then I can certainly add them by clicking on Monitor, and now you'll see them on your right-hand side, giving you a quick little snapshot of that particular student that you want to keep an eye on. To remove them from your monitoring, just click on the little star up there and they're gone. And you can change that whenever you want. And notice too, you can also individually notify a student this way too as well. For those of you that are not interested in this, you can disable this feature, although I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you can disable this feature via the menu up here in the top right select retention center, and then on this left-hand navigation page, like a book, if you're teaching multiple courses, they'll be listed out here. Simply just clicking on stop, this, stop tracking this course, and you'll, it's gone. It's still going on out there. I mean, the system, the Blackboard system behind the scenes is still chugging away through all this retention center stuff, but it's just not displayed within your course site. So if at any time you want to go out there and say, well, I'd like to take a look at that now, you just go back into that same drop-down menu, click on Start Tracking, and it'll show you what's going on, at least at that point in time within your course site. So that's about it. Is there any questions you have online at all there, Jeff? Not right now. Any questions from the audience? Ken's in? Yeah. I'm on you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone.